In this video, I'm going to talk about kinematics in two dimensions. So the big difference in two dimensions versus one dimension is that now in, instead of designating our position with an x or a y value, now our position is given by an x-y coordinate. So it has both x and y components. Okay. And this can be thought of as a vector that points from the origin. So a vector, typically call it R, that points from the origin to a certain location. Okay, so before we typically had number lines, either horizontal or vertical, but now we have an xy plane. It's not y, x. Okay, so this may be our location in space, and it may have points x and y, and we can think of this as a vector r that points from the origin. Okay, so it has this is your x, this is your y. So you can think of the magnitude, same way we find the magnitude of any vector, by using the Pythagorean theorem. So our x component is just the x distance, and the y component is just the y distance. Okay. And then if you wanted to express your position in terms of some angle relative to the x-axis, then just as before, we could do inverse tangent of the y component over the x component. So how do we talk about displacement in two dimensions? So displacement is still defined as the change in an object's position. And now that we know how to write the position in terms of a vector, we can do it very easily. So if we have a point one right here, then this would be our first position vector. So we'll call this R1. And maybe we move from this position to a second position over here. So this has a position vector R2. And we, what we want from the displacement is the change or delta r. Okay, so that would be the vector connecting these two points. Okay, so this is my first x value and my first y value. And then I move to some other location with a different x value and a different y value. Okay. So this is how much my y value has changed, or delta y, and this is how much my x value has changed, or delta x. Okay, And if it's hard to see, this delta r uh, should be uh, the vector that points between these two vectors. This is defined as r2 minus r1, so you could draw this. Or the easiest way to think about it is in terms of adding vectors. So if I wanted to get to this location at R2, I could either go straight there from R2, or I could do R1, and then from the tip of R1, I could add the vector delta R, and that would get me to the same location as going um, straight from R2. And then we can just rearrange this, so subtract R1 to the other side. And this gives us our definition of displacement, R2 minus R1. Okay, so now we can talk about velocity in two dimensions. So just as before, we started with average velocity. So average velocity in two dimensions is just our displacement over time, just like it was in one dimension. 
So this would be our R2 minus R1 over T2 minus T1. And our instantaneous velocity would be this, defined the same way through calculus by taking the limit of delta T and it goes to zero. Okay, and really um, we should just think of this as the slope at some point or at some instant for the instantaneous velocity of the position versus time graph. Okay, just like before. And our instantaneous velocity, if we're moving through space, so say we take some path through space that looks like this, our instantaneous velocity at any point will be tangent to that path. So if we pick a few points, this will be the direction of our velocity. So at any point, it may have an x component, vx, and a vertical component, vy, and make some angle theta relative to the x-axis. Okay. And just as before with acceleration, we get formulas that look much the same. So acceleration would be the change in velocity or change in time. So how much are you speeding up or slowing down, but also changing directions. So final velocity minus initial velocity, T2 minus T1. Okay. So there are two ways that our velocity can change we can either change the magnitude or we can change the direction. So if we look at the relative directions of acceleration and velocity, we can see how these affect each other. So if we have velocity that's to the right and acceleration that's in the same direction, that's going to lead to a velocity vector that increases in magnitude. So we draw that with a larger length arrow. And this just means that our speed increases. So the length of our vector got longer, the magnitude or speed increases. If our velocity was going to the right and our acceleration was to the left or in the opposite direction. Well, that means our motion is tending to the left, so our velocity vector will get smaller. So the magnitude decreased, so that means our speed is decreasing. And if you let this go long enough with your acceleration and velocity in opposite directions, eventually you would stop and then start going to the left in the direction of the acceleration. So the acceleration tells you which direction your velocity wants to go or will end up eventually if you keep accelerating. Okay. So now we want to look at a new case now that we're in two dimensions. And it's what happens when our velocity and our acceleration are perpendicular to each other. Okay. So now there is no component of my, my acceleration that is parallel or anti-parallel to my velocity. So that means my velocity vector is not going to change its length. But now it will change its direction, so its length will stay the same. So the speed is constant. So the length stayed constant. But now my direction changes. Okay. So now this is all the cases, but we could combine them so it is possible that we may have velocity vector and then an acceleration vector that has both a component that is that is perpendicular in this case maybe this is in the x direction and v is um, all in the y direction and then it has a component that is parallel to v 
So now you can kind of treat these separately. The component of the acceleration that is along V or along our velocity or parallel is going to make it increase in size and the component that is perpendicular is going to make it um, change directions. So here the parallel component affected the speed or the magnitude just as before and the perpendicular component affected the direction. Okay, so you can have a combination of these two situations. Okay, let's look more at the direction of acceleration. So in order to have acceleration, that must mean your velocity vector changed. So you had an initial velocity at one moment, and now you have some new velocity. Okay, so if you look at this equation for acceleration, you have a vector on the left, acceleration, and you have a vector on the um, right, but it's delta v, it's the change in velocity. So, imagine our initial velocity vector is v1, was this, and then we had a second velocity vector. So our velocity has changed directions, and we want to find the direction of acceleration. Well, acceleration is not going to have the direction of either of these. If we want to find the direction of A, we need to find the direction of delta V, which is V2 minus V1. So if we draw that, V2, and then from the tip of V2, we draw V1. or minus V1, and now we connect them. This is the vector delta V, okay? And so since delta V is kind of down and to the right, this is going to be the same direction as our acceleration. Okay, so these have the same direction and typically this is what you see when you have an equation like this where you have one vector quantity on the left and one on the right they have to be pointing in the same direction because um, that's where they get the direction from there's only one vector on the left and one vector on the right so their directions must be equal just like anything else on either side of the equal sign okay and so I kind of like to imagine that the acceleration vector is sort of pushing on the first velocity vector, so pushing on V1, and turning it into the vector V2. Okay, so if you sort of imagine you have V1 here, but now you start accelerating, so it's kind of like you're pushing down and to the right, that's going to make you change your directions toward V2. Okay, so I just physically imagine this um, acceleration arrow turning um, my velocity vector as it's moving. Okay, so now we can talk about a special case of um, 2D kinematics, just like we did in one dimension. So in one dimension we had free fall motion where objects were only under the influence of gravity. And in two dimensions, we have something similar, but it's called projectile motion. So an object in projectile motion, object, an object may be given an initial velocity. So it may or may not. Maybe it started from rest, so it may not. And then it proceeds to follow a path that is only determined 
by gravity. So again, an object that is moving through the air only under the influence of gravity, that is an object that is in projectile motion. So I sort of think of this as free fall, but in 2D. Okay, so everything that was true in the y direction for an object in free fall is still true for an object in projectile motion. But now we have to consider the x direction as well. Okay, so if we launch a projectile at some initial velocity and some angle theta, it is going to move through the air in a, it's called a parabolic trajectory. So parabolic just makes a parabola that you learned about in algebra. And trajectory is just a fancy word for path through space. So notice we're plotting our motion on an xy coordinate system, so we haven't looked at how the position's changing in time, but this is actually the physical path your object would move through. And since it's only accelerating or moving under the influence of gravity, the acceleration at all points in the y direction will be minus g or minus 9.8 meters per second. And since gravity never works left to right, and gravity only pulls you down, the acceleration in the x direction will always be zero. And the y direction will always be minus g or minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And these are things that are always true in projectile motion. So always true in projectile motion. And so they are often not given. When you're solving problems where there's an object in the air under the influence of gravity, you're not going to be given that the acceleration is zero in the x direction and minus g in the y direction. This is just something that you know physically because the object is moving in projectile motion. Okay, so we have a path that our object is taking in x and y. So it has some initial velocity and some angle theta. So the first thing I always do, if I'm given the initial velocity um, or magnitude of velocity along with some direction in two dimensions, I always want to calculate the x and y components of my initial velocity. Okay, So I like to draw a picture, first of all, and then I draw another triangle and my vector is always going to be my hypotenuse. And then I'm going to draw the x component and the y component along with the angle that I'm given. Okay, And then based on this triangle, I can identify my opposite and adjacent sides. And again, the vector itself will always be the hypotenuse. And then I can solve for v naught x and v naught y, or the x and y components of my initial velocity. This is something that personally I do at the start of every problem, and then it's, it goes into the things that you know, and you can go from there and solve the problem. So if you start from the definition of sine theta, opposite over hypotenuse, so remember your SOHCAHTOA, in this case, this is v naught y over v. And so our v naught y, if we solve for it by multiplying by v, or v naught, is just v naught sine theta. And we can do the same thing for cosine, but once you know which component sine is associated with, you know you immediately know cosine is the other one, and vice versa. So this is going to be v naught x over v naught and give us v naught x is v naught cosine theta. Okay. So this is something that you'll get accustomed to. As soon as you're giving a magnitude and direction, you can always find the components of that vector. Okay, And then you just have to remember, 
If your vector is v naught, then your components will be v naught x and v naught y, not just vx and vy. Okay, so these are still initial velocity components. Okay? And then since ax, the acceleration in the x direction is zero because gravity always pulls down, so never left to right. This makes our life really easy. If there's no acceleration in the x direction, that means our velocity isn't changing in the x direction. So that means vx is equal to v naught x. Our velocity at all later times is equal to our initial velocity. It will always stay the same. So once we calculate it at the very beginning, we know it for all time and we don't have to worry about it. Okay? And so that's something that pops out of projectile motion that's really convenient and makes solving problems easier when you uh, know that you always have this bit of information. Okay? So if we want to find the magnitude of our velocity. We want to find the magnitude. So when you hear the word magnitude, you should always think um, Pythagorean theorem. If we want to find the magnitude and direction, angle theta, of our velocity vector, so not just one of the components, but the velocity vector, at any other point, so at any, I'll say at any later time, all you need is Vy. So we just need to find Vy. Because we already know Vx at all later times. So we can get the magnitude and direction of velocity at any time if we can only find Vy. And so how do we do this? We are going to use our kinematic equations. Okay, so I'm going to write the kinematic equations, and then I'm going to show you what they turn into for projectile motion. And there's some simplification that is worth noticing and will make it easier to solve problems because you really don't have as many equations as you think you do. Okay, so in the x direction, I'll write these all in terms of x, we have our first kinematic equation, vx equals v naught x plus axt, but since ax is zero, this turns into vx equals v naught x. So that's what we just said before, just thinking through it, but now we can see it mathematically. If we do next kinematic equation, vx squared equals v naught x squared plus 2ax and x minus x naught. Again, we have ax equals 0, so all of this um, goes to 0. And this leaves us with vx squared equals v naught x squared. But if we take the square root of both sides, we're left with this same uh, relationship, vx equals v naught x. So these two equations really don't give us new information. We know that the x component of velocity is going to stay the same. And so these two equations don't really bring us anything when we're solving um, problems in projectile motion. If we look at the last equation, delta x equals v naught x times time plus one half ax t squared. Now again, ax is zero, so this whole term's gonna go away. And we get delta x equals v naught x times time. This is really the only equation, and I'm actually gonna write it this way, vx times time, because v naught x and vx are the same thing. 
this is really the only equation in the x direction that gets us any new information. Okay, so instead of having three equations in x, we really only have one. So only one, this is the only one equation we need for x. Okay. So that makes things, makes things a little bit simpler, knowing that we don't have you know, six equations, we only have one for the x direction. And these are going to be, for the y direction, these are going to be the same as in free fall. Okay, so we'll write these in terms of y, v not y, min, uh, or plus a y t. I'll just write them out really quick. Plus 2 a y y minus y naught, and delta y, or y um, equals y naught, v naught y t plus one half a y t squared. Here, if we substitute um, a y equals minus g, then these will turn into following equations, vy equals v not y minus gt, vy squared equals v not y squared minus 2g y minus y not, and delta y equals v not y t minus 1 half gt squared, and so these are your three y equations. So in projectile motion, you really only have four, and that's better than six. So you're mainly learning information using your y equation. So um, by default, if you don't know what to do, it's a good place to start um, to see if you can learn anything, one, from your x, because you only have one equation. And then most of the action is happening or taking place in y. And so one thing I want you to keep in mind is here we have done a substitution of ay equals minus g. So this minus sign in all of these equations has already taken account of the fact that we are accelerating down. So g is a positive 9.8 meters per second squared. So when we plug in the value of g, it will always be a positive number and we don't ever have to worry about any other minus signs. These minus signs have already taken care of the downward action um, from gravity. So don't double count your negative signs. Okay, after projectile motion, the next type of uh, 2D motion that we see is called uniform circular motion. And this is just a basic introduction into circular motion that we typically see after doing um, 2D kinematics. So an object that is moving in a circle or in a circular path at a constant speed is said to be moving in uniform circular motion. Okay, so this is sometimes abbreviated UCM. Okay, so draw a circle. And we said before that our velocity is always tangent to our path. So if our path is a circle, that means at any point, in this case we're going um, counterclockwise, our velocity is always going to be tangent and its direction is always going to be changing. Okay, well if we're moving at constant speed that means that the magnitude or the length of our velocity vector isn't changing. And so if it's only changing directions that must mean that our acceleration is perpendicular, so this sign means perpendicular to our velocity vector. Okay, And so it either has to be inward 
uh, toward the center of our circle, circle or outward. And so it turns out if we want our velocity to go around in a circle, the acceleration needs to be inward. Okay, And since it's inward toward the center of the circle, it is always along the radius. So this acceleration is often called um, radial acceleration, and we usually put a subscript RAD to denote radial acceleration. And again, since velocity is always tangent, we often refer to um, this velocity as the tangential velocity because it is always tangent to our circle. Okay. And so since the direction of our velocity is changing, this means that in uniform circular motion, we are accelerating. In fact, it is impossible to go in a circle or any curved path with constant velocity because in order to change your direction, you must change, uh, you must be accelerating. Okay, your velocity vector must change if you go in a curved path. That means by definition you are accelerating. You can go at constant speed, so a constant magnitude of your velocity, but once your velocity vector changes direction, that means you are accelerating. Okay, And because our acceleration is perpendicular, we will always be at a constant speed. perpendicular, constant speed. We'll draw another circle. So we have our velocity that is tangent. So sometimes this may be abbreviated um, or with a subscript TAN for tangential velocity. The acceleration is radial or along the radius pretty easy to remember. And this would be r, the radius of our circle. And if we want to find the value of radial acceleration, I won't go through the derivation. It's in most intro physics textbooks. But it's given by a rad, that's how I'll pronounce that, is v squared, or tangential velocity squared, over the radius. And sometimes you may see books write capital R for the radius, but these are the same thing. Anytime you see R in this context, it is the radius of your circular path. Okay, so radius of circular path. And I say it like that because there, at any given point in time, there's no physical circle anywhere. But if you were to track your position over time, that is what would trace out a circle. Okay. So it's useful to describe, since we're just going around in circles, it's useful to describe our motion, so to describe, in terms of the angle that we're moving through. And we also want to know how fast we're moving through that angle. So if I draw another circle, we often start the positive x-axis. And if we start going around in a circle, we're going to sweep through some angle. So first you're going this way, and you're here going this way. Okay. And the quantity that tells us how fast we're going around or through this angle is called our angular velocity. And we write that or denote that with 
and omega, so a Greek lowercase omega, uh, omega, sorry. And this is angular velocity. And angular velocity has units of radians per second. So anytime we're working in uniform circular motion, our default unit for angle will always be radians. And so our angular velocity will be in terms of radians per second. And since we're used to talking about our linear or tangential velocity, we want a way to go back and forth between the two. And it turns out you can do that using um, the relationship velocity equals r times omega. So v equals r omega, where this is your tangential velocity, and omega is your angular velocity. Okay, so this equation relates the linear velocity to angular velocity. The final thing that we might want to do when talking about going in a circle is to describe um, our motion in terms of complete rotations around the circle. So one complete rotation is called a revolution. And one revolution, sometimes abbreviated REV, is equal to 2 pi radians, so 2 pi rad, and that is equal to 360 degrees. Okay, so you can convert between um, any two of these just by creating a conversion factor. And then we give a special name to the time it takes for an object to move through one revolution. And we call that the period. So, period. And time, time is typically measured um, in seconds, and it's given the letter T. And so the period is also going to be a T, but now it's going to be capital since it's a special type of time, and it's also measured in seconds. And so how might we get express the velocity in terms of distance and time in these sorts of units? Well, the velocity, just in general, is distance over time, so how far you went and how long did it take you. And if you're going in a circle, your distance is equal to the circumference of that circle. And the time it takes for you to go around, we just define that, that is the period. So the circumference is given by 2 pi times the radius, and the period is just capital T. So our velocity is 2 pi r divided by the period. Now that we have this, we can rewrite our radial acceleration so now we can rewrite a radial by replacing the velocity. So in some situations, we may not have velocity. And so we can use these definitions to rewrite and get a new expression for the radial acceleration. So if we take formula V equals R omega, and we substitute that in for our velocity, we will get R omega squared over R. One of our R's is going to cancel on bottom, and we will be left with one on top, so we'll have omega squared times R. Okay, so A rad equals omega squared times R. So if we didn't know velocity, but we knew angular velocity, so if we know omega, then this is one way of calculating angular um, or radial acceleration. The other thing we could do is 
we could take our formula and we could substitute our other expression for tangential velocity. If we do that, we get 2 pi r over the period, all squared, because that's all v. And once you do some simplifications, again, you're going to have one of your r's cancel out, and everything else gets squared. So you get 2 squared, which is 4, pi squared, one of your r's survives, and you get a t squared on the bottom. And so now you have an equivalent expression for radial acceleration in terms of the period. So you see in any case you need the radius, but if you have the radius um, you can use this expression if you know the period or can find the period. And you can use this other if you know omega. So that's it for um, 2D kinematics and uniform circular motion. I'll have another video where we go through just problems on 2D kinematics and a few uniform circular motion problems so that you can go through those and get some practice.